Hello, I'm Jamie, and for this short video, I am joined by Joe Gilbert, who is our Acting Executive Director for Global Conservation. Hello, Joe. Hi, Jamie. Joe, tell us a bit about your work. So, um, well, I'm, I'm currently, as you've said earlier, the, the uh, Acting Conservation Director, but my normal role is the Deputy Director for Conservation Programmes. So those conservation programmes, they're in the UK and they're international. They cover things like um, how we build from our nature reserves, our fantastic nature reserves, into creating rest restoration of whole landscapes across the UK, aiming towards getting large areas of the UK really restored and thriving for nature. Um, then internationally, we're working on projects like, um, like the Gola Rainforest, where we work in partnership with our birdlife partners and with the government there in Sierra Leone and in, in Liberia to to protect the forest and to help the local people to have a, a better livelihood. And you, of course, you can help that project by buying the, the Gola chocolate in them from our shops. And very tasty it is too. Now, thanks to the wondrous supporters that we have, very, very generous supporters over many, many, many decades, we manage over 200 nature reserves. And I know that as part of your various roles um, in the RSPB, you've visited quite a lot of them through your work. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and also some of the most exciting things that you've seen on our nature reserves? So I've been at RSPB now for over 20 years. And that, as you say, I visited a lot of reserves during that time. Partly in one of my former roles, it was to give advice to uh, site staff on how to, um, how to change some of the management to improve them for, for different species and habitats. But more recently, it's been to meet teams and see how things are going. But uh, some of the pleasures that I've had is me getting to, some, to the islands around the place. I think the, the Turn Islands must be about amongst the most exciting places to visit. Because of, um, because of the special nature of the role, I've been able to get to some of the places that, it, that not everyone can get to. So I've been over to places like the Skerries and Coquette Island, where you go over in a little boat and then you have to clamber out of the boat and creep up the path um, where there are turn chicks and turn eggs all over the place, bombing your head, and um, uh, you have to you have to tiptoe between them into the safety of the of the accommodation there. So I was just thinking about Coco. Actually, we do we don't open the island to visitors in the summer, but I'm sure when restrictions are lifted and during nesting seasons in the future, we do. There, there is a boat that does little tours. I think you can go out and and you can see it from a safe distance. So yeah, I'm not sure I'd be that keen on being dive bombed by turns, but I can see that must be quite thrilling and immersive um, experience. Well, one of my most special evenings was a night out at Merse Head. So I'd gone up to, to have a look at the reserve and we'd arrived in the evening. And um, one of the things that we were able to join in with was an evening survey of the Natterjack toad. So for, for quite some years, we've been working on a reintroduction of Natterjack to Mercehead and they've been put into water bodies quite near to the, to the, um, the sand um, sea wall there. But actually there'd been a big storm. I don't know if people can remember, there was a, there was a storm, um, uh, it was about 2012, 2013, and it had blasted through and the sea had come right through. And we thought we'd lost the Natterjack toads because it had they'd gone saline in the water where they'd been. But actually the result was that the Natterjack toads had spread throughout the reserve. So we found many of them in many different places. And we were able to join in with uh, the team there that were counting them and photographing them because they're actually, you can photograph them and recognize individual toes. So it was a really, really special evening, really evocative because they make such a lovely noise. So Rain and Marshes, uh, it's really easy to visit Rain and Marshes. It's a lovely walk. It's a place where we've managed it to get the, the nature really close. So, um, so you can see um, you can see lapwing chicks really close there if you're if you're lucky you can sometimes see the odd waterfall uh, but it's a place where you can walk around we've actually done a lot of work there to um, to wet to, it, it's, it's always been a wetland but we've made it really flourish as a wetland so it's absolutely thriving in wildlife so one of my um, one of my uh, good memories was of being sent a picture of the first some of the first lapwing chicks that were were, that were produced within a, an area where we'd been putting extra fencing to really protect that zone. So um, pinging those through to my desk and suddenly seeing the results of our labours was absolutely excellent. 
Now, you talked a bit about lapwing chicks and fencing there. So there is a lot of stuff that goes on on our reserves to manage them, especially for particular birds and other wildlife that we might not notice as a visitor. Can you think of any things, any particular things, um, as well as, as as well as the sort of fences for those ground nesting birds that might be going on that people might not pick up on straight away when they visit? Yeah, so I mean, one of the, one of the things that um, has performed really well is the work that we've been doing in, to create reed beds for bitterns. So I think um, you might go to somewhere like Lake and Heath or, or Ham Wall and and it looks like it's been there forever. It looks really natural. It's absolutely uh, thriving with wildlife. But those reed beds have been created and they are managed to keep them in that uh, in that open state of, of reed bed and water. So, so somewhere like Ham Wall, I, I first went there in 1995 when it was former peat workings. Um, we were at that time, the, the staff on the ground were putting in reed bed plugs to try and grow the, the new reed bed. And since that time, I mean, it's, 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 it's unrecognisable now what it's like. You just wouldn't believe that it was all created. It's now a, an astonishing place for both for bitterns and for other birds that are colonising from the continent. It's, I think um, that's, that's a really, really good example. And some of the, the places that, that we, we do talk about, um, actually, you've given some, some great ones here. So Rain and Marshes, Hamwall, Lake and Heath. Um, there's, there's, there's various others scattered around the UK that were not um, thriving reed beds. They, they perhaps had been wetlands in the past, but humans had used them for other purposes. And now they're being converted back. And there are other places, aren't there, like uh, quarries that we're now moving from, um, you know, the extraction of minerals to, to actually uh, oases for, for nature. Yeah, so there's there's places like uh, like Middleton Lakes where where they were um, it was a gravel quarry and we've been working there with the minerals uh, company to restore that and now it's 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 a lovely walk around some beautiful lakes and wetlands and again you wouldn't really know that it had a, a quarry in it, in its past. I mean there are, there are other places as well um, that I mentioned so somewhere like Rathlin Island in Northern Ireland where we it's been many years there that the the the, the team on the island have been working with the people the people who live on the island and also with volunteers who've been coming backwards and forwards to restore um, the the taller grassland the early the early tall grasses uh, around the fields for corn crakes to come back to and for years there were no corn crakes there but this year for, um, there were five calling corn crakes, which is, you know, from nothing to five over a short period of time is, is, a, is an amazing achievement. But I would say it's taken a lot of work to get to there. So it's, you know, it's it's good result from, from the hard work. But again, you wouldn't necessarily know that all that hard work has gone in as you walk around. I believe lots of nettles were involved as well, which must be particularly hard work. Yes, they were. They had to transport a lot of nettles. There weren't, amazingly, there weren't that many nettles on Rathlin, and they they had to be brought across. So um, they were cleaned and and brought across and uh, scattered to to create N nettles. Are really important for corn crake because they grow early in the season. And corn crake, when they because they migrate from Africa, when they arrive, they're looking for places where they can hide. So nettles are a, a key part. Again, fa fascinating stuff, which a lot of us might not realise as we're walking around these places. So we've talked a little bit about some of the uh, UK work. What are the kind of big global conservation projects that we're working on at the moment? Well, Gough Island would be the biggest one that we're doing at the moment. So, so Gough Island is part of Tristan da Cunha. It's, uh, it's in the South Atlantic. It's, it's 2,600 kilometres from Cape Town, which is the nearest port that you can get there from. But it's a UK overseas territory. So uh, um, it, it's a place that we have a remit to work on as it's part of the UK. It's a really, really important seabird island, but it has a, a big problem there, which is that mice were introduced accidentally 100 or so years ago by people who've gone there to hunt seals. Um, and those mice have spread across the island and have been predating the seabirds. And I mean, they, they've been eating the eggs and the chicks of the seabirds about 2 million or so a year. So um, it's had a big effect on the, on the number of birds breeding on the island. So we've got a team out there right now who are working to remove the non-native invasive mice to restore the island back to its former glory. It's, um, it's got some amazing species there, like Tristan albatross, a very rare bird called the Megillifrae's prion that nests in, the, in caves there. But they've had such poor breeding success that they're threatened with extinction. So um, it's, 
it's special work. They're out there right now. Amazing stuff. And you can find out more about Gough Island on our website. Um, I think that's absolutely incredible. So, so much stuff that is going on at the moment that's that's almost kind of hidden for, from us as kind of regular nature reserve visitors. Um, all this stuff behind the scenes is absolutely fascinating. And hopefully we can talk about it a bit more in future videos. But for now, thank you very much for your time, Joe. Thank you, Jamie.